Welcome to Laptop Radio. Today's topic is execution and not labeling. Developing leadership skills for executives. And we have Brian here. Hello, Brian. Hi, Michelle. Great to see you. Good to see you too. I'm excited to talk to you about execution and not labeling. Both really important skills. Most people would think that execution is important. But most people don't really think about why not labeling is important. But let's talk a little bit of your story. I know you've been on the show before. So tell us a little Mm -hmm. about you. Sure. I've spent most of the last 30 years in the footwear industry. And I've had all kinds of roles and responsibilities with small companies, with globally large companies, and everything from sales and management to more executive leadership roles. And the current company I'm in now, I'm in charge of operations, which means handling the management of all the major facets of the business and managing people, managing processes, and and helping us to evolve as a brand, becoming more efficient and, of course, more profitable. But my background, when I went to university, a hundred years ago, I majored in sociology. And I've always had this ability to see things from a broader perspective and to be able to stand back and focused a lot personally on not judging humans for who they are. I certainly, like all of us, we judge humans for their actions, whether or not they're good or bad or the lack of action. But I've always thought about, okay, who is this person? Where do they come from? Why are they the way they are? I have my background, how I grew up, where I grew up. And that certainly makes me different from every single other human being, regardless Mm -hmm. of whether or not you are raised in the same household, have the same parents, have a lot of the same experiences. We have our own unique and individual perspectives. And and as I've evolved into my current role, I think it's an advantage and the opportunity to really study people even more and look at execution and look at why we as human beings label. For whatever the reason, we all have the tendency to project our DNA and our experiences onto other people. Yeah. And it can be as simple as I like this type of food and you should too, because I like it because it tastes good. And all the way up to how you manage customers. And instead of trying to teach my team how to not label, how to not project your perspectives and your experiences, not to assume or expect another human being to understand where you're coming from. It's the reverse. Your role is to learn and to listen to how other people react and for clues as to other people's need. And execution and not labeling are intertwined directly because obviously in all of our roles, hopefully we're executed. Let's talk about execution, Brian. What is execution? To me, execution there's two different types that i look at there's executing a role a responsibility a project that delivers desired and positive results Mm -hmm. and there's execution which a lot of people think is staying busy Mm -hmm. and by my customer experience manager said to me a few weeks ago, I was venting and Mm -hmm. the results weren't what I expected or intended them to be. And so I was frustrated and I was venting. And she said to me, no, it's great. And I said, no, I said, effort without results. It's just practice, which Mm -hmm. is important. But the effort and the actions need to be executed in a strategic way, Mm -hmm. following the necessary processes and procedures or creating new ones that might be better to achieve those desired results. So I think there's people see execution just because they're carrying out a task, they think they're executing. 
Mm-hmm. But what is the objective of that task? What is the, the goal? Let's discuss the process of the intention to the result and how to execute the intention to get the result. What is that process like? Yeah, it's funny you say that because when I was put into this estimate to take over this role, <laughs> the, the founder of the company, who is also a good friend of mine, said to me, look, you're going to uncover some holes in this business and just be ready for it. I don't know what they are. You don't know what they are, but just delving into those processes and procedures, it's easy to run reports to show sales, run reports, however you want to slice and dice them. But what does all that mean? And you really have to drill down to what the processes are. And we all have processes that I know for Our company in particular, some of the processes have been around for five, six, seven, eight years. And although the structure of the process is intact, the the details of the process and the individual steps have needed to be evolved because technology changes, business changes, relationships change. And so it's really about taking a look at each one of those processes and extracting all the steps, all the details in each step of the process to understand what they are and understand, do they make sense? And because the ultimate objective is is the results, our sales and profitability. I think a key ingredient in the execution and the processes and procedures are to make sure each one of your team members understands what the end goal is. Mm-hmm. It's not just about processing an order or shipping an order or running an event. It's okay. The end game is the positive results. And are we achieving those? Mm -hmm. And if we're not, or if if we're not achieving them to the ability or the level that we have set forth as our goals, then you really have to take a look at all the different steps that lead up to the result, which is what I've been doing for the past several months. One of the biggest things that I've learned in this 30-year journey is it's critical that each team member understands what you're going after. Mm -hmm. And because we each have, all of us have our own agendas. And even within the same company, like we still think, okay, I'm doing this, I'm doing a good job, or I'm accomplishing this. But are you? If the overall goal is A, and you're delivering B, even though it might be good, it's not A. It's not what we have set as the parameters of what we're going after. So it's really just drilling down to each particular step of each process and then breaking those steps down in the details of, is it working? Is it not working? What kind of KPIs do you use to determine results? Not sharing confidential information, but just in general. What are some of the metrics that you look at when you're looking at execution? In sales, which regardless of my role, we're all in sales. We're all in sales, yes. We're all in sales. And so it comes down to what goal have you set and did you achieve it? For us, you can look at the top line sales number. That's easy. And break that down by customer, by whether or not they're new or whether or not they're, they've been around for 10 years. What are those results? Because the execution of the plan for each customer is going to be slightly different. I mean, if you have a customer that's been with you for 10 years and you're looking for uh, a specific percentage increase, it's going to be a lot different than the percentage increase you're looking for out of a brand new customer. Mm-hmm. So from a sales standpoint, the KPIs are pretty easy to measure. Are the mm-hmm. numbers there? And then from a bottom line perspective, which I'm also involved in quite a bit, is what's the profitability? Because it's two different things. When you look at KPIs from a sales perspective, it's the, the revenue numbers, the gross numbers, and then it's the profitability. And you can break those numbers down by different factors of basic sales, how much investment did we make in 
advertising or vendor support or whatever else there might be that can affect the profitability. So that's important. And then internally, from whether or not it's our customer experience team, our team that manages our web business or marketing, it's really the same, I think, outline of what are we achieving and how are we all going to get there individually to collectively deliver those results. How do you communicate your intention from the beginning to an entire team? I feel like as an individual contributor, it's easier to execute, especially if you're not at a company just for the paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you really care, if you really want to perform, then I think it's easier. But if you work as a group, you have to communicate that to the entire group and make sure that everyone has that common goal. How do you communicate that in a way where you don't freak out people and say, hey, we're going to do this and we're going to execute this way. And these are the results that we wanted to see. The word that you used a few times, communicate. Mm -hmm. and But you have to communicate <laughs> effectively yeah. and you have to communicate consistently and continuously. Mm -hmm. Because again, to our not labeling topic, none of us are the same. I might be able to communicate to one team member in a way that's a little bit more direct mm -hmm. or harsh. I was arguing with the founder today and all in good fun, we were serious and it's not personal, but there are other team members that I don't want to use the term walk on eggshells, but you've got to communicate in a way that's going to be effective for them. Not how you feel as an individual, how you want to communicate, how are they going to receive your communication? Mm -hmm. One thing I learned managing sales reps is that we all have unique personalities and that's what makes us as yeah. individual humans, right? Yeah. We were all born in different places. We all live in different places. And culturally, we're all different. We might be living in the same country, mm -hmm. but whether or not it's East Coast, West Coast, North, South, Midwest, you can find much different cultures and ways in which people see the world just based on grew up. Yeah. And I think it starts, obviously, at the beginning of each season, like our sales meeting is next week. You kick that off with the bigger picture goals, which are drilled down to each rep. It's that consistent management of results and consistent feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think the communication and the feedback on a consistent basis is probably what's the most important because we all need to be held accountable, but we're only able to hold people accountable if they understand what their roles, responsibilities, and goals are. Yeah. Yeah. So just communicating what those intentions are and what to expect and then results so that they know beforehand. I think one thing that I learned and seen is, for example, I think one year I went to the pool and I noticed that there are moms who give their kids a timeline if they want to leave and say, oh, we're going to leave in 30 minutes. So you have 30 minutes to swim. But then there are also other moms who basically say, oh, we're going to leave now. So it's very disruptive. And it's like managing a company. <laughs> if you tell your team and set expectation, you'll give them time to do things. However, if you just tell them to do something right there, this is mm -hmm. a little bit more abrupt. I wanted to ask you to share a little bit about your company. Yeah. So... Revere Shoes is a comfort fashion brand that is focused primarily on the women's side of the business. We were established in 2012 in Australia, and a few years after it was established there, two of the founders, a married couple, brought the business over here, established it here. I think what sets us apart. What our competitive advantage is that we make beautiful sandals and shoes and booties, which a lot of companies do. We make them 
with all kinds of comfort built into it, which a lot of companies do. However, what sets us apart is that we're focused on the personalized fit Mm -hmm. and almost customization of the fit and the comfort for each wearer, because to my earlier points about we're all unique Mm -hmm. and our feet are unique. There are no two feet that are the same. Yeah. Even within the shoes. (laughs) I know shoes really well. (laughs) (laughs) We have one foot that's a little bit longer and skinnier and one foot that's a little shorter and wider, but footwear manufacturers make the pairs of shoes identical, mirrored, but identical. So we incorporate fit and comfort features such as for footwear, closed up and and booties, will include fillers in case one shoe or booty is a little bit bigger, has a little bit too much volume in it. But the wearer can't go down in size because you have to fit for the larger foot. So we have fillers that can take up just a little bit of volume to make things a little bit more snugger and, and more comfortable. For our sandals, we actually include strap extenders with Mm -hmm. every single sandal for every single strap. We make our shoes in mediums and wides. Mm -hmm. However, sometimes you might need a little bit extra width Mm -hmm. or you might be on holiday. And we know when you're walking all day long or traveling, especially by air, your feet Mm -hmm. are going to swell. They're going to change. So we make strap extenders that can be customized and we provide them for each strap of every sandal. And maybe you just need one extender on one sandal and not the other. Maybe you need all three or four, whatever it might be, but it allows you to expand the width. The the strap extenders provide a little bit more than half inch of additional adjustability and they're engineered and designed with the same shape, color, finish, material, whatever it is. So it gives you that ability to customize without taking anything away from the look and the feel of the shoe or sandal, which is why you wanted to buy it in the first place. It looks great. Awesome. Yeah, I love comfortable shoes. I think that there is a need for it. Currently, if you purchase a lot of the shoes, even the branded shoes, you can't walk an entire conference with it. And I try sandals as well. Did I wear Jimmy Cho sandals and got blisters on my feet? And then I had to go to one of the stall and then they were laughing at me. I had to switch it to something else. But comfortable shoes are really important, especially if you're traveling and exploring a town. And also walking around at a conference. So that's awesome. Yeah, it is. Yep. Let's talk about time to execution. I, I find it really different because I'm used to the next day turnaround. <laughs> because yes, you you know, I came from corporate world where mm-hmm. everything is done the next day. I'm not used to a one week turnaround or a one month turnaround. But I feel like sometimes when you're working with startups or innovative companies, the time to execution is just a little bit more slow than I'm Mm -hmm. accustomed to. Having managed a lot of transactions per week and a lot of business people per week, and that's normal for me. And then working with a lot of startups where things just take a lot longer to get done. And this is easy stuff like presentations and decks and things like that. What do you think about time to execution? How would you approach that? So I think this is something that you mentioned earlier that we talk about daily Mm -hmm. and it's managing people's expectations. I've got probably 20 or 30 favorite sayings, but one of them is we teach people how we want to be treated Mm -hmm. and that's connected to managing their expectations. Because if you just say, hey, Michelle, I've got this project, I'd like it done next week. And you just hand it over to them. And they're like, okay, I'll get started on it in three or four days. <laughs> and they might have heard you want it next week. Mm-hmm. But was that managing their expectations to a level that makes them pay attention mm-hmm. or makes them adjust their timelines or their work styles? 
because again, it, it also goes back to, we all have different and unique DNAs. Mm -hmm. Some of us work faster, some of us work slower, some of us work smarter, more creatively, whatever it might be. So it's a part of managing their expectations on what your expectations are. How do you teach them to treat you? Not necessarily with, yeah, you want them to treat you with respect, but you want them to treat you with a level of understanding that, no, I need it by next Tuesday, by 3 p.m., mm -hmm. because this project impacts five other projects mm -hmm. that are also due because I've got a meeting at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, and mm -hmm. I need these six projects to be done at the same time so I can put everything together. Yeah. So I think it's also explaining the objectives on your end, your side of things. Yeah. Your relationship with them might be one-on-one. -on -one. You might have five or 10 other things that are all a part of this broader project. Yeah. And just to help them understand your timelines and your needs. Yeah. Almost need to draw a picture just to show them. <laughs> no, that's funny. We all work and we all learn differently. Yeah. And some of us, like I'm visual and I'd rather be hands-on and visual than just listening to somebody tell me you need to do A, B, C, and D. Well, what does that mean? It yeah. means something different to you than it does to me. So show me. Yeah. Let's discuss not labeling. And I think that is really interesting because we live in a society where everything is labeled. Everything or part of things has a name. Either we're labeled by race, by our sex, by the things that we do full time, the things that are hobbies. It's very confusing. How do we become a person, a human that does not label? And, and what are the benefits so, of not labeling? That's a great question. I don't know what the benefits are because <laughs> I've grown up in a society of, of labeling. And I think, I think when we are all born, mm -hmm. there are no labels. Mm -hmm. I don't see color in human beings, or I certainly don't see religion in human beings if I'm just born or if I'm a year old, three years yeah. old, four years old. We're taught. So I think it's societal where and when it first started thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to affect change enough other than just through conversation. But the benefits of not labeling, I know there are benefits because I just looked at you, which I think I did way back when, as just a human being. Yeah. We started talking. I just found you to be an interesting human being. Yeah. If I started out the process of when we first met by labeling you or judging you or assuming you're this type of person or that type of person, then it clouds my receptiveness to you. Yeah. And so I think that's the biggest benefit is that if we are all able to get to a place where we can just accept humans as humans, as one of us, as a brother and sister, mm -hmm. then I think that would have positive and lasting impact and effects throughout everyone's lives. I feel like in order to be not labeling, we need to unlearn that. How do you unlearn that? I think it's very challenging. However, I don't know if we can ever unlearn I think we can adjust, and I always like to think I'm mindful of evolving, mm -hmm. constantly evolving. And so I think it's being mindful just in the not labeling. Mm -hmm. Just be mindful that we all label, and that if we're mindful of it, then I think it's practice. Yeah. Right? They say you need to hear something or do something three times before it starts to sink in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part of it. Just be mindful that if you look at a human mm -hmm. and it's judging, I mean, judging is labeling without ever meeting the person. You've already yeah. created a picture in your mind of who this human is. So if you do get a chance to meet him or her, your whole being is clouded in that 
genuine relationship because you've already defined who that person is. Yeah. And I think it's also just carrying it a step further. So when you have kids, it's something to be proactive and mindful about teaching them that get to know that person. Mm -hmm. I think that old saying about don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah. That says a lot right there. The book and the title is literally a label. Mm -hmm. But don't judge a book by the cover. And you shouldn't judge human beings by the labels that you and your friends and family have been putting on these humans for thousands of years. Yeah, I think part of labeling is having assumptions based on stereotypes about a person. For example, if I go to an entrepreneur event and have bell bottoms and a shirt that is a little bit fashionable, I don't look like an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And my question is, if I'm not doing something related to fashion, and I love fashion, but I can code, and I'm an entrepreneur, does that take away my credibility as a human who loves to build things? Just traveling around the world and talking to different people, I meet entrepreneurs from all over the world, and everyone dresses differently. How do you get to know someone? What are some of the first steps? I think part of unlearning and relearning, we have unlearning, this is relearning. If I have this stereotype about you, Brian, then I am being mindful of it. But I also wanted to put that stereotype down and get to know you. So I'm going to ask you questions. And I think that's how we were introduced to each other, right? On a plane. Yeah, yeah on a plane. <laughs> Just started talking. That's it. And asking questions. Then I think we were able to do it yeah. without assuming. And so I think the relearning, I almost think the relearning has to take place a half a step before the unlearning because you need to relearn yeah. how to meet somebody, how to meet a stranger. And I think you should, or I should, this is I personally do it, is that I'm open mm -hmm. to anyone. Really, like, I, who am I to judge? Who am I? I don't know all the paths that you have taken in your life. It's not fair and it's not accurate of me to look at anybody and, and look at how they're dressed. Now, that's taken 62 years of evolving as a human <laughs> for me to get to this point where, tell me about yourself. Who are you? Like, where do you come from? Why are you? Yeah. And, and again, I majored in sociology. It was by accident, but also I think a natural fit. I also minored in economics. The sociology has always driven me to be open and mindful to all humans. Yeah. And, and I'm in sales. My role as a salesperson isn't to sell you something. It's to uncover your needs and to help figure out if I can fill some of them. If I can't, I'm not going to try to force something down your throat. Yeah. If it's not right for you. It's getting back to just keep asking questions. People talk about themselves. And you start to realize we are all not that dissimilar. I was really heavy in biology. I, I don't see race like the social construct is because for me, a skin tone is different. It's a human. Mm -hmm. We have the same organs, the same skin, the same brain systems. For me, I don't understand all the boundaries and the divide. For the most part, there's uniqueness in terms of different food that people make and different culture. I wanted to talk about the combination of execution and not labeling. How do we become a great leader and a good executor if we do not label people in a team setting? I think labeling certainly needs to have a place mm -hmm. if you run operations. Well, that's yeah. a label. That's a label, yeah. You know, manager of operations. You're a manager of our customer experience team. Yeah. You know, you're a CEO. You're a product designer. So labels are necessary mm -hmm. when it comes to those, I think, non-human elements in our life. Mm -hmm. Food is labeled, right? Soda can, everything's labeled. Yeah. But 
and positions and titles are labeled. I think they're labeled, although I have my label of ops manager. However, I'm involved in all parts of the business. Yeah. So sales and marketing and finance and customer service and product development and the warehouse. Mm -hmm. So I might have a title, but that's not fully who I am, even in my professional role. But you do need labels in those situations because at the end of the day, you're still holding people accountable. Yeah. And so you label someone with a title and a job description and roles, responsibilities, and goals to hold them accountable. Yeah. But are we labeling the humans in a way that puts them in a certain position correctly or incorrectly? Yeah. If we label a position as a finance manager, Mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean that you or I can handle the role of a CFO. Yeah. Just because we have the title, we have the label. So again, it goes back to we each have our strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. And you need to put people in the right roles. Mm -hmm. And then you can create labels that match up with them. Yeah. That can create success and, and all that good stuff for them. Yeah. I had a real quick story that helped me, I think, open my eyes to a lot in the world. I was in my 20s at the time playing softball, and the guy that managed the team, sponsored the team, had a friend that was the head mechanic in one of the maximum security prisons outside of Boston. And he came to us and said, hey, you want to play softball against the prisoners? And we're like, yeah, that'd be great. So, of course, you get nervous because you've already labeled these prisoners as dangerous human beings because they're in prison. Mm -hmm. And we get there and we had to go through all the security because we were playing in the yard of the prison. Mm -hmm. So you go through the corridors where the prisoners incoming and outgoing and you walk out in the yard and it's just like the movies and you've got prisoners with aluminum bats <laughs> and you start playing the game and you realize these are just guys. All right. Some of them could have been dangerous, but yeah. there's such little difference. Like we're so close to every other human being just because to your point, because we're human. Mm-hmm. That's what should connect us. Yeah. Awesome. What are some instances where not labeling is bad? We talk a little bit about the roles and the structure. What must be labeled? I think, and this is something I was working on today. I think the roles, responsibilities, mm-hmm. processes, and procedures, you need to label them so you can define them and yeah. apply them to the appropriate departments and appropriate, I think, elements of the job, and also to hold people accountable. If we have a process for either submitting an order or communicating financial information, invoices, statements, and there are six steps to the process, and there's a step in the process or two that's being missed, that, I think, is a positive label because you can go back to hold that person accountable and say, hold on, this process, which is invoicing. What does that mean? The label of invoicing and the processing those invoices and communicating them, if they're not being carried out, then it's a way of just looking back to not only hold people accountable, but be able to teach them. Here are the steps within the process that we all need to be following in order to achieve the results that we're after. Yeah. There are benefits to labeling. I just find that most of the labeling that I think about is the labeling of human beings. Yeah. I mean, we need labels. Yeah. I think, for example, saying someone is smart versus dumb, when you give them a task, that's probably not good because they might not receive the same message when you communicate to them or they learn in a different way. It could become harmful. 
used consistently, it might be internalized. So it's not really a good way to motivate people. No, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I think it was Henry Ford that said, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. Yeah. That's another one of my favorite sayings. And I think you have to take a step back and certainly as a manager or in your role of developing quite a bit, if you're leading people or teaching people or expecting results from people, you've got to be clearly mindful of your message and your expectations of them while you're teaching them. Mm -hmm. While you're training, you need to be everything we've been talking about. You need to be aware of how they learn and what their psyche is in how you can communicate most effectively to them. Again, I used to be able to scream at my oldest daughter when I was coaching soccer. Mm -hmm. And it used to fire her up. Because she got sick of listening to me to scream on the sidelines. <laughs> and that produced results. Now, my youngest daughter, and my son was the same. My youngest daughter, I had to treat her with a little bit more gentleness. And it's just who she is, who each one of my kids are. And yeah. how they receive communication and how they learn. Because we're all unique. Yeah. Is there anything you wanted to share that I have not asked you? I don't think so. I love this conversation. I know people might think not labeling or execution. How long can you talk about this? But I think there probably could be classes established. On... For each. <laughs> <laughs> not labeling 101. <laughs> yeah, not labeling 101 and execution 101. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Appreciate your openness and ability to have conversations about pretty much anything. And, and I think real quick, just us having the conversation. Yeah, mm -hmm. and hopefully people are listening and will listen to this and pick up something from it. But it's getting the two of us thinking about it a little bit more so that when we're out traveling or out meeting with the people that we're meeting with, that we have a little bit more conscious level of understanding and mindfulness of not label and how to execute. Yeah. In the corporate world, execution is really important. I do expect something to be done the next day. That's normal for me. For startups, given that some of the founders are young, I know that's not an excuse. The labeling. I know that take a little bit longer. <laughs> And way, way, I'm just learning to communicate a little bit better, more effectively. But I think both of them are important because sometimes it's hard to change contacts where you're comfortable at one spot and you're used to a culture and then you meet 10,000 projects and each project has their own culture. And so you don't want to label, but you want to go in and learn how they're doing things so that you can help them change it. And for me, my purpose is not necessarily the project itself, is how do we create a better experience online for the next generation to come? Because I've seen technology change lives, but again, the last 10 years has been very centralized. A lot of it is at the expense of our data and our privacy. So I just wanted to see how we can utilize the same technology and new technology to move that so that it could benefit everyone. It's more than a few people on earth. With that, I have to learn myself to not label, not assume, but to ask consistently learning and relearning every day, which is part of the growth. I mean, I think there is an intertwine, is, isn't there, of execution mm -hmm. and not labeling. It's really related. It is. Yeah, it is. And hearing you talk about younger folks, we might not side or agree with how they do things or at the pace in which they do them, but we do need to see things from their side and manage their expectations on what we're looking for. However, it may come down to 
what they bring to the table and what they lack. It's a balancing it. Yeah. They're a unique individual and so are you. Yeah. Do they offer enough benefit to you to keep them on or to let them run a project? Do the benefits outweigh the lack of pace that you're expecting or the lack of structure that they might not have or they might have or it's a balancing do they give you what you want and if they do then you're gonna have to sit back and let them be them yeah while they do it yeah so it's leveraging execution versus performance Mm -hmm. and being humble this is regardless of age whether they're young or old a person who has more of an ego it's just generally more difficult to communicate with Yes. Even if you tried, and that doesn't occur with everyone, sometimes people do change. There's a pattern of it, then you have to reassess again. Yes. So it's like constantly reassessing. Mm -hmm. It is. And being mindful of that's what you need to do. Yeah. Being conscious of it. What is one piece of advice that you have for the community? The biggest piece of advice which relates closely to everything we're talking about is mm-hmm. that we're all human. Mm-hmm. Like there's so much to gain from other human beings in the world, whether or not you know them or not. Be open to human beings in your life. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest piece of advice. I don't care where you are. I don't care if you're at the mall, if you're on a plane, if you're at a bar, or at a restaurant, just be open to human beings. And it's amazing the people that you will meet and the people that will provide things to your life that you didn't even know you were looking for or needed or could benefit from just like the relationship we have yeah that's true i agree with you sharing experiences trying to educate and train and help people who happen to listen to the show not just about different technology but to also have humanity in it. Because Mm -hmm. if you want just to know tech, you can just ask an AI. There's just really no need to talk to humans. However, I think humanity has things that machines don't. We have a complex system of a brain and emotions and uniqueness and cultural and likes and dislikes that are completely different. It's not so dry. I think if we... Go out there and understand and learn a human for the human's sake and not to use them or to get something out of them or to extract them in some kind of way. Then it becomes yeah. different. Even if you look at a job situation, that's different because it's their time and expertise for a result. Like when you go and play volleyball or pool, you're interacting for fun. Humans has a good part and a bad part and there's duality. No one is 90% good and 90% bad. Enjoy that richness within one human. See them as a person. I think that's super awesome. It is. It is. And like hole in the wall, seafood a few weeks ago. And I've been there a couple of times. Both times, the same bartender was there. My first visit, and I do stay conscious of just being open to any human being. And yeah. So we're just chatting away and... We heard a noise and it was the door, but nobody was there. So we start talking about ghosts. And so I start talking to her about this ghost that I thought lived in the house that I grew up in Massachusetts, really old house. So we start talking about Massachusetts. And then one thing led to another thing. And then the following week, we started having a conversation about octopus. (laughs) <laughs> and talking about documentaries and books. I said, hey, have you ever heard of this book? I had the book. And one week it was ghosts. And another week it's octopus. And same person. And if I wasn't open, or if she wasn't open, conversely, and I just went in there as a patron and said, hey, give me a beer and a burger. Yeah. And had everything closed off. Then I wouldn't have had these really just cool, fun experiences with a stranger complete stranger we connected like we're all connected yeah yeah i think we are all connected the more you travel you realize that we all want the same thing or similar things yeah yeah. the more you travel 
the more you realize how small the world is. It is really the world small. gets smaller. Yeah. 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 You also see that humans are the same or similar. We are connected and we are similar or the same. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate it. Yeah, that was it. fun. Thank you. Yeah. Buddy, yeah bye bye. All right. All right. Take it easy.